Well, good evening, everybody. Long time no see. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> That's not funny. You're making fun of me now. Never. I bet. All right. Let's put our uh, sins to the side and let's pray. It's joking. Uh, please stand. Meditation from Psalm 148. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded they were created and established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all the peoples, princes and all the rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men, and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face. Come, Spirit of God, the same spirit that hovered above the waters, the same spirit that hovered above the chaos, come and recreate within us. As we understand your word and as we go deeper into your word, may we be recreated in your love. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome, everybody. Awesome to be back in uh, behind the podium. I love it. Uh, I love Bible study. And... Uh, Please excuse my absence because sometimes if I don't have a good streak of good weeks, if I have to do one week and then be out for two weeks and then one week and then three weeks and then what, it just, it doesn't work. Um, so anyways, Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. I need you guys to read it. It's not that long. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at a lot of details. And we're going to be looking at this, and we've done this before, it's been years since we've done it, and I want to add more to it. And it becomes important to be able to realize how God wants to speak to us. We proclaim Genesis every time we say the creed. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Genesis 1. Parts of Genesis 2 as well. For our sake, became human, died. Why? Genesis 3. This is why we come together. And also, he died, he rose. That's also Genesis 3. So it becomes important for us to understand the basis of our faith. This is where everything got started. This is why Christ came. It also becomes important to understand the whys. Why did God create us? How did God create us? Why are we screwed up if God created us? And we need to look at all of these. I don't want to look at this just from a scientific point of view. There's a little bit of science there, but I want to go a little bit deeper. The scriptures are there for us to grow in faith. And this is why it is written. It isn't just written just haphazardly, just so that, you know what, we got to put in a story together. Um, so we're going to look at a lot of detail. Um, while we're here, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to say, I don't agree. Don't be afraid to say, wow. Just don't be afraid. I want as much dialogue as possible. I want to give you so much, and I just don't want to just dump on you. 
um, becomes important. If there is something that needs to be explained a little bit more, or something that just it needs a little bit more time, um, be moved by the Spirit, and don't be afraid. Now, the worst that can, that can happen is for me to say, no, we're going to move on. But I'm, I'll try not to do that too many times. Now, as we look at the details of the Bible, number one, I need you to trust the Bible. I'm going to repeat this. A lot of people look at the story of Genesis as, oh, you know what, there is this mythology, and God wanted to show something through the mythology. Is there some elements of truth to that? Sure. Yes, there is. But we could lose Jesus but over, by overanalyzing, you know, this is a story that's a little bit, it looks like, and some people, they've written books and books, like the Babylonian. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Babylonian story, very little, and how they wrote books and books on how the story of creation of the world is so much like Genesis. Great. I have no problems with that. I have no problems with God using imagery of the day, mythology of the day to preach truth. Everything that Jesus preached is truth because he is truth. And everything that is written in the scriptures is truth. Sometimes we need to understand it in the context it was written. And sometimes we also need to look at it in the way it was geared towards its fulfillment, which means here's Jesus. So basically, we're going to be looking at Genesis through these eyes. For the cross, for Jesus. Because this is the way God wanted it to be done. In the beginning, it was very small, it was very short, it was very simple. But it developed. And there's more stuff that's added to it. So you're going to see me quote outside of Genesis because there's more explanation that comes and its fulfillment is Jesus. But it isn't just fulfillment of Jesus that's actually written for you today, right here, right now. This isn't just, oh, this is a cute story of how God created the world. Some cuteness in it. It is about how God created the world, but it's going to be quoted in how God wants to recreate the world and recreate you and put everything as its source. So we're, we need to, and if I fail at doing this, it's my fault, and so you need to pray for me, that we need to put this into context of what happened into Christ and into me. What does it mean to me today? And if it doesn't mean anything for me today, we failed. So God, the Holy Spirit, wants to speak to you today using Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Today, specifically, 1. We'll see how far we go. Might spend a half hour on just the first two verses. I don't know. It's not like I've never done that before. For those who've been in my Bible study before. Oh. Anyways, um, we're going to do some analysis, but the analysis is going to be spiritual. Because as I said, if it doesn't make sense for us today, if all we're going to do is just look at an explanation of what happened, we failed. Uh, the other thing is... Um, as we look at, and I mentioned this already, what does it mean in their time? Why God used this kind of language? What does he want to say to us? How it's fulfilled in Jesus? How it speaks to me today? And as a result, I need to keep something in mind. We can't look at it in literalism. For example, did a snake really speak to Adam and Eve? Well, we can spend a lot of time to answer yes or no and miss the point. And I will make the argument that the devil will want us to try to answer that question and spend all of our time answering 
a lot of literalisms because the devil does not want us to grow closer to God through the text of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Can you write a thesis on if the devil spoke? Yes, you can. You can write a 500-page book on it if you want. It's not why we're here. And so we need uh, to look at this in an organic manner. What is God trying to say to me using a snake? Adam and Eve. A garden. Everything else. That becomes the more important point. And this is what we are trying to do. Um, I got this. This is a beautiful quote from Pope Benedict, God rest his soul. Uh, I believe in our lifetime he will be called Pope Saint Benedict the Sixteenth. Scripture was not written as a whole from beginning to end like a novel, but it is an echo of God's history with mankind, the story of God's struggle with human beings to make himself understandable to them. It is also the, stro the story of their struggle, our, to seize hold of God over the course of time. Wow. Said so this is a relationship built on a struggle from the very beginning. God struggled with me, creation, my struggle with God. And it's not a struggle like we're all, we're all arm wrestling or whatever. It's a struggle where God is trying to do everything right for me and I'm screwing it up. And if I am selfish, I'm screwing up and I'm struggling with God. Any question, any comments before we get started? Before we jump in, yes. I don't mind repeating it. You gotta find it first. I found it. The scripture was not written as a whole from beginning to end like a novel, but it is an echo of God's history with mankind. The story of God's struggle with human beings to make himself understandable to them. It is also the story of their struggle to seize hold of God over the course of time. So, many writers of the Bible, but one. And we can look at different parts. The different parts can only be understood as part of a whole, complete, and that completeness is only understood in um, Christ. And this is, um, all scripture was uh, written as one, though by many, written by the Holy Spirit, unchangeable and cannot err, uh, make, uh, written by human authors, and mistakes can happen when human authors are writing it. So it's an imperfect writing of a perfect story, of a perfect message, I should say, not just a story. So it's imperfect in the sense that I, as a human being, when I am under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'm writing in bad grammar. But what I am writing is truth. I'm saying if I was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if I was the writer of Genesis, if I was any of those. And so this is where we begin. Any question? Speak now for the next hour and a half. Yes. Well, God, in this, it's a great question. Um, God has always been working. And don't forget, the creation of Adam and Eve was perfect. Not like my creation, not like your creation. That perfect creation also means that there was a relationship with God, which we will look at. That relationship with God was ongoing. God did not leave Adam and Eve. He didn't just come out and say, get out of here. That's in Surah. Get out of here, I want nothing to do with you. 
And so he didn't just come out and say, go away. Because here's the thing. One of the Psalms says, if you hold back your spirit, we die. And it's not just physically I die if God isn't keeping me. If for one day God removes his hands from me, I will die. What's keeping me from killing you, killing myself, raping, stealing, pillaging, destroying? Uh, what's keeping me from doing every heinous, not just evil, the worst of the evil, heinous act in the world? It reminds me of a quote by St. Uh, Padre Pio. He says, the world can live um, for a year without the sun, S-U-N, but I cannot live for one day without the sun, S-O-N. Imagine if for one second I hate everything that is ever was, whether it's myself or anything else, because every ounce of love is from God. Every ounce of, God, of love is from God. If God isn't with me, for one split second, I will experience hell. And I will experience absolute, complete, and total hatred and destruction. One second, I won't be able to live with it. Imagine. So God was with the people. God was with Adam and Eve. God still speaks to them, spoke to them at the time. Still, God wants to lead them, but it also depends. And if you can tell, uh, if you think of the story of, of Cain and Abel, when Cain and Abel gave, uh, presenta presented God with sacrifices, and it's God who spoke to Cain and said, Cain, what you, what, you didn't give a good sacrifice. And there's a problem with you. You keep this up, you're going to fall. I, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Um, Cain didn't listen. And what we will see is, um, later on when we do the rest of Genesis, is that what led to the flood is a constant rejection of God on a regular basis. Let me put it to you this way. You're not... I, I'm going to say this. You're not born a serial killer. You're made into a serial killer. You're not born to kill, but you make a series of choices that leads you to become a rapist, a serial killer, a murderer, um, a, a uh, pathological liar. These things come as a result of decisions that were made that lead up to this. Think of the last sin, major sin, God forbid, any sin. What were the things that led to it? Think about that. That's an important question to look at sometimes, where I don't just go to confession and go, bless me, Father, if I have sinned, here are my sins. Please check them off. What led to it? What caused it? What's the root? These are the things that I need to get into. Anyways, any other question? All right, let's jump in. Genesis, first book, first chapter, first verse. In the beginning. What in the world does those mean? In the beginning, on a human level, means that there was a time when everything started. And it's very interesting, by the way, I'm just going to throw a little bit of um, atheist scientists like to come out and to say that there were multiple galaxies, that there was no beginning. And what they don't want to do is look at a beginning. Um, I'll give you one very interesting scientist who up until now um, I'm just going to say it. Uh, Stephen Hawkins. Stephen Hawkins is the Einstein of, you know, before he died, what is it, five or six years ago. Um, he was the smartest man alive. 
Of course, he had a disease and he had to, you know, he couldn't, you know, speak very well. He had to write his, I don't know, thousand page book one letter at a time through his eyes and looking at whatever through software. But this man's genius was asked, when did the world begin? How did the world begin? Where did we come from? Because physically speaking, I know everything's origin. This is made out of metal, this is made out of whatever, and, and we know its origin. Atheistic scientists do not like to answer that question. So they come out and they say, well, that's not a question you can ask. I already did. So where did we come from? Well, you can't ask that question. Here's an excuse they give. Well, there's always been creation. So it's infinite. That's a problem, because physical things are not infinite. They're finite, which means that they came from a source. And this is where one of the philosophers, I believe it was Aristotle, who came out and said, well, there's an unmoved mover. Call it whatever you want to call it. We call it God. We call him God. It's not just an it. But there's an unmoved mover that moved everything that he himself or it itself is unmoved. That means there is no origin. So here's God, and there's nothing like before God. This is the start. This is the beginning. This is where everything gets started. Now, interestingly enough, a book just came out, ended last year, early this year, about Stephen Hawkins. Stephen Hawkins, who believed in infinite number of galaxies, and therefore, it's only bound to happen that one of the planets in the infinite number of galaxies is going to have life. And probably there are other galaxies and other planets somewhere that we'll never be able to see. They're just too far away. Uh, maybe a thousand years from now we'll be able to see it. And they'll have life. It all came by accident, and it came as a result of error. Accident and error. Okay. Stephen Hawkins, as far as we knew, died as an atheist and said, there is, you can't ask the question of origin of time. His closest collaborator just wrote a book. And he said that Stephen Hawkins had just changed his mind before he died. Here's what Stephen Hawkins said. The science of today says, according to Stephen Hawkins, there are no multiple galaxies. He wrote a book called The Origin of Time, and then he changed his mind on what the origin of time. Big Bang. You know what the Big Bang is? It's a, the whole world, all of the galaxy was actual size, this big. I measured it. And it blew up. And space is expanding. They can actually, believe it or not, they can measure the expansion of space. And one day they want to send a rocket to look at the expansion of space. Of course, question number one is what's on here? No answer. Can't answer. Problem number two. This is what Stephen Hawking says. The origin of time started with the Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, there was no time. In the first one one-thousandth of a second, all creation was not only present, but physics as we know it today was different. That's the, that's the partner of Stephen Hawkins, saying that this is what Stephen Hawkins believed before he died. Why am I throwing this at you? Because science is finally realizing there is a beginning. And actually, science does not negate God. It cannot know who he is. That's revelation, and that's the difference. What science can do is it can point to a God. And it can point to something that's keeping this world together. Because here's the other thing that scientists have come on and said. So take a microscope. Take any object. Blow it up a hundred times. What do you see? Whatever. Blow it up another hundred times. A thousand times. Well, you're going to see atoms and neutrons and whatever. Blow it up another thousand times. And you're going to see space. Material is held together by space. By immaterial. Blow it up another thousand times and they'll never know what there's out there. Here's the point. Point is, science points to a beginning, an origin, 
and a base that holds everything together. And Genesis says, in the beginning. And the next word is the word that makes all the difference. In the beginning, God. Oh, boy. So now, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's try to unpack that a little bit. Question number one, why tell the story? And when was it told? Um, according to many scientists, or to biblical uh, scientists, I should say, they were told in light of the biblical mythology. What's the biblical mythology? Murdoch, the king of all the gods, sounds familiar, by the way, who studied Greek mythology, who stole it from us? We came up with it first. Still wrong. Anyways, um, Murdoch, got into a fight with other deity gods. And what he did is he took one, beat her, split her, and made her into heaven and earth. What do the Greek gods say? The Greek gods come out and say, well, there were the titans. The titans who ruled the world, and then the gods came like Zeus and all of his group. And what they did is they fought them, and they destroyed them, and they chained them, and okay. What's the difference? It's using that kind of imagery, but there is a fundamental difference. Number one, creation did not come as a result of war. Creation did not come as a result of hatred. In a sense, what it's saying over here, and we'll see throughout the scriptures, is that God is an artist. And if there are any artists around here, if you're painting, if you're making statues out of marble or out of whatever, where does the image start and begin? Right here. And if you really like what you're doing, it's right here. So all you artists that are out there, you know better than I do, I'm not an artist, but I play one on TV. Anyways, um, nobody gets my jokes anymore. <laughs> Forget it. I quit. So you take a canvas, and what's in here starts to get implemented in here. Poets, what do you do? You start to verbalize, you start to speak your words, and then you try to, if you want it to rhyme, if you want it to whatever. Musicians, what do you start to do? You start to play your instruments, and you come out and you go, how does this sound? And most artists need time to develop this. And, you know, with the except, very exception, very, very, very few musicians that had all of it, everything worked out in here, and then they just translated it. And they said Mozart was like that. But the other ones were like, Beethoven was like, ah, no, ah, ah, here we go, I like this one better. You know, so they, they, they pounded and pounded it. But with God, it's already developed here and here. So now imagine when God created you, your beginning. In your beginning, what was God thinking? Why did God create you this way? It is a story about, uh, I've said this story many times, uh, Michelangelo. Michelangelo did not like painting, even though he painted some of the most marvelous stuff. He loved sculpting. That was his passion. One day they brought him a big slab of marble. And he started looking at it and said, wow, how gorgeous. How? And everybody's looking at him going, what are you talking about? It's a slab of marble. And he says, can't you see the angel that is dying to come out of that marble? Or David or whatever thing that he sculpted out of that. He saw it. And then he translated it into it. That's the artist that is God. And that's what he was thinking. I'm going to use like human imagery. That's what God is thinking when he created the world. It's not Tiamat, where Murdoch, the Babylonian god, got into a fight with Tiamat, killed her, split her. This isn't Zeus. This is written at a time, 
using that kind of imagery, but to say, no, 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 you guys are all wrong. Why does the story start talking about the stars of heaven, the two major lights in the heavens, the, the sun and the moon? Because that's what they worshipped. And this story is saying, <laughs> you guys are idiots. God created them, and you're worshipping them? Now, like the psalm that I read earlier, all of God's creation gives praise to God, and it is an image of God. And we're going to actually find it. We're going to see it. God created the world in his image and likeness. And that's how he created it. And everything, when I look at the world, and you can see, and this is where St. Francis of Assisi was a master of this. Isn't his feast tomorrow, I think? So he was a master of seeing God in creation. For him, sitting in adoration, directly looking at God, or sitting in nature, directly looking at God, were the same. He didn't choose one over the other, he chose both. And he touched God. Another great saint of our time who loved nature so much, he would actually run away. And that's John Paul II. And just as a side note, I rode in the bus and he had a, a Volkswagen bus uh, that actually used to take him and run away with it. And I actually rode it. It was actually very cool. And then it, it belonged to our Chaldean nuns in Rome. And they had bought it when, after he died, and then somebody stole it. <laughs> but I just want to say I rode in it, and it was really cool. <laughs> and not only did I ride in it, he actually had a little window and a little, like, um, perda, you know, a little thing. He just opened it and closed. That's how they smuggled him out of the Vatican, to go where? To the mountains, to go skiing, to go into nature. Because he loved to see God in nature. And that's the beauty of what this story is trying to say. In a couple of days, Pope Francis is going to come out with his second encyclical about the duty that we have towards nature. Nature isn't made to be worshipped, it in itself worships God. So Mother Nature isn't to be worshipped because Mother Nature has a father up in heaven. But this is all trying to build in. And it was written at a time to say, look, people, stop worshipping this. That's what's going to make you fall. St. Paul's going to write about this. Letter to the Romans, first chapter. He talks about they let go of the creator to worship creation. And in a sense, you know what? If I am running after women or I am after running after other things, what am I doing? I'm no longer looking at the creator. I'm stuck with creation. And that's the problem. Why was creation given to me? So that I can, through it, touch God. Why was it physical? Imagine. Creation is different than, the creation of the world is different than the angels. Because look at what he says. In the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. The heavens is a symbolic of all the angels and all the spirits. The earth, everything physical. Everything came from God. He differentiates between the two. Not just because heaven is away from the earth, but he's saying that everything has its source there. So you look at the story on the uh, creation of the angels. In the creation of the angels, he, God did not give them bodies, physical bodies. They're spiritual. But he gave you a physical body. Ask yourself this question. Why? Why did God give you a physical body? And here's a problem. Because a lot of people think that the body is terrible and it's evil. And we're going to actually see in chapter 2, you know, uh, God is going to tell Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. He's not talking about multiplication table. He's saying, I want you to physically unite with each other. That's not a bad thing. But what have we done with it? We now have created something a little different. 
we've made the touch to have the possibility of it becoming evil. The touch is not evil. In itself, it is not. And we're going to see, and I know I'm pushing it ahead, there's an innocence that was lost. Adam and Eve were naked. But they didn't know they were naked. What do you mean they didn't know they were naked? How could you not know that you're naked? Because, like little children, like a two-year-old, running naked all around. I pray to God we don't see this anymore. But when we were kids, we used to see it. We used to go over little cousins and whatever. Ah, like, okay. But there's an innocence about it. There's a beauty in it because these children understand innocence. I pray to God that they don't do this when they're 20 or 40. Or God forbid when they're 60. <laughs> because we've lost that innocence. And that's important. And this is what all of this is trying to come together. God created. Uh, can you create? Mm -mm. What can you do? Two verbs. Differentiate. Make and create. In the Bible, the verb to create is always given to God. Why? It's a creation out of nothing. And we can't do that. What do we do? We make, we take things, and we change it. Like, what's the latest recipe that you came up with? You threw a bunch of stuff in whatever, and, you know, and we're like, hey, all right, sounds good to me. It looks good, tastes good, smells good. Did you create this? No. Now, there's an interesting, there was a, there was a book that came out not too long ago, and it was a monk, he was a Maronite monk, he wrote about um, a lot of the Chaldean church fathers as well as similar to the Maronite as well as the Syriac church fathers. And he makes an argument. The argument is um, creation out of nothing, it's true, but there's a problem with it. God did not create out of nothing. God created out of love. That's why God created and he actually quotes the St. Ephraims and the, all the great saints. And he goes through this argument. As he's not negating. He says, look, the church is teaching from the Bible that God created out of nothing. It's true. But it doesn't fully explain everything. Again, I go back to the artist. When the artist is creating, when the artist is sculpting, when the artist is writing, when the artist is making music or cooking the latest fashion, meal, whatever. Artists is coming out of the depths of their heart and their knowledge and their understanding, putting it all together and putting it right out there. So now you see God is the center. New Testament, God is love and anyone who lives in love lives in God and anyone who lives in God lives in love. Oh. See, now we have a better understanding of in the beginning God created. In the beginning God created. We're stuck on five words. We can even go longer than this. I'm just going to spare you. So you can come back next week, maybe. <laughs> Some of you are going to come back and go. But this, right now, God is saying to you, from the beginning, I loved you. I created you. Why, God, is everything screwed up then? Why am I screwed up? Why do I have these issues, sinful issues, physical issues, problems? Where did all of this come from? We'll talk about that in a minute. Four hour. Um, what did God create? Everything. That's the formula. Heaven and earth. So then, um, the complete answer is actually found in the New Testament. It's not enough to say that God created everything. Um, the Trinity created. 
You will see later that God speaks in the plural. Let us make man in our image. And there's a reason why they do that from a linguistic point of view, and we'll get to it in the next few weeks. But here's what the New Testament, putting everything now uh, together. Um, first of all, you see uh, God is the Father. In the next verse, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Who is the Spirit of God? That's the Holy Spirit. So you got now God the Father and God the Holy Spirit that they did not know, but we do. But, um, St. John, how does he begin his gospel? Same exact words, in the beginning, was what? Ah, and the word was with God, and the word was, wow, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. I'm confused. Who created the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit? And the answer is yes. Every act of this holy family is an act that is always done in unison. Who died and saved us? Specifically, it's the Son. But who saved us? It's the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Who sanctifies us today? It's the Father and the Son through the Holy Spirit. Every act is an act of the Trinity. Act of creation, act of salvation, act of sanctification, act of blessing. This is now done through the Trinity. Creation, salvation, sanctification. It's wrong to say that only the Father created. It is wrong to say that only the Son saved. And it is wrong to say that only the Holy Spirit sanctifies. Uh, St. Paul gives us more. And this is what he th says also in regards to all creation. And the Word, he says, All things were created in heaven and on earth. All things were created through him. And now he adds something else to it. And for him. That means you were created for Jesus. I'm not just talking about all creation, the sun, the moon, the mountains, and the hills, and the snow, and the rain, and whatever. All were created through him, all were created for him. He is before all else, and him all things hold together. So Jesus holds me together. The Father holds me together. The Holy Spirit holds me together. So now we have a better understanding. I was created by God, out of love, so that I can belong to God. Now we've gone beyond Genesis, in light of the Holy Spirit and the New Testament. Now I'm not just looking at this mythological version of a, you know, a whatever. Imagine this. Take this the next time you go into adoration. Or stay here another minute when everybody's getting up and saying, I, Lord, I, whatever. And just say, what? What did you do? Why did you do it? For who did you do it? Ask him. And he's already given the answer. And this is where God is saying, I love you. And that's why I did everything. And so now, in the physical, God wanted to dwell with us and within us. And we see this, by the way, physically. Story of Exodus. When the Jews left, by sail, they were saved by God and they left Egypt. And God says, I want to make my dwelling with you. And he says this elsewhere in a lot of the prophets. I want to dwell with you. That's veiled language to say I want to dwell in you. Why do you think we do adoration? Can you do adoration in your own room? Yes, absolutely. 
Can you do adoration? Would you do well to do adoration in front of the Eucharist? Oh, absolutely. What's the difference? God physically present before you and says to you, Hi. You know, um, I mentioned this in one of the homilies not too long ago, but I, I doubt if you heard it. Um, there was a gathering of guys who were thinking of becoming possibility, they have a vocation or not, and whatever. One of them blew my mind. And what he said was he had read somewhere saying that we should not be saying, God, I love you. He says, we should be saying, God, I love you too. Keep that in mind. Because it's a response to God's love that we love. It's a response to God's love that I want to know. It's a response to God's love that I want to dwell deeper. It's a response to God's love who sits over there waiting for me to receive him physically. And through the physical, I receive him fully. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Every spiritual blessing in the heavens through Jesus Christ our Lord. Where is that found? Anybody remember? Mass. Final blessing on Sundays. Guess where it's ta taken from? Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Phenomenal. Now I know why God created me. So that I can be happy with him. So I can dwell with him. And unfortunately I have to struggle because it used to be perfect that God created me. And here's where we start to see a problem. Look at this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. What? So, it's watery and chaotic. And here's and the other stories of, uh, what do you call it, the Greek and the Murdoch and the Babylonian stories, water is chaotic and it's destroying everything and there's a flood and, got it, put that to the side. Uh, anybody been in a flood? Uh, if you had a flood in your basement? Uh, everybody been through the, like a dam that broke? Or anything, have you seen any of those destructive powers? That was what creation was. Which brings the question, why did God create it this way? Answer, he didn't. Here's what he says in Isaiah. I did not create the world to be formless and void. Huh? Where did all this come from, God? How did this happen? Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 says the following. Basically, talks about war and the results of war. And God and Jeremiah are looking at it and saying, waste and void came as a result of war. So there was a war between, in the beginning, God created the world. And in just before, we're looking at the world and that was waste and void. Something happened. What's the hint? Follow the angels. Somewhere between in the beginning when God created the world and right now where we're at in scripture, in Genesis, the world is a waste and it's void. That period of time is the hint for the falling angels. And we don't know much about it. Here's what some of the other th stuff I want to read from the Old Testament. Wisdom 1.13 says, God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. He fashioned all things that they might have being, and the creatures of the world are wholesome. There's no destructive poison in them. So we are seeing hints of destruction and sin, and God is saying, I didn't do it. Again, this is the hint of attesting 
we find out later on, a little later from the scriptures and later on even in the understanding and church history and the development of understanding, is that God created everything perfect, but God also tested everything. And therefore, the angels got their first test. Humanity got its second test. The testing of the angels. Do you want to be with me? They had a one-time choice forever because they had a better understanding of us. Saint, uh, Saint to be, Fulton Sheen, give a meditation. First words of Jesus on the cross was what? Father, forgive them. They do not know what they have done. First thing that he writes is says, that's the difference between humanity and the angels. The angels knew what they did. But out of their arrogance, Satan wanted to be God. And that's why we know this, because who's the angel that responded to him? Anybody? Michael. You know what Michael's name means? Michael's not his name. Angels don't have names. But we have names for angels based on what they have done or what they have proclaimed. Michael, who is like God? That's Michael saying, you idiot. You want to be God. That's going to come back to haunt us because that's going to be chapter 3. What does Satan say to Eve? Why aren't you eating of this fruit? God said you can't. Well, yeah, of course God is going to say you can't. You know why? Because he doesn't want you to be like him. That was the temptation of Adam and Eve and the angels. Except nobody tempted the angels. They looked at their power and they looked at their strength. The good angels looked at it and, and gave praise to God. Satan, and you have hints of this in Revelations chapter 12 and others, Satan saw it and said, I could be God. I am most powerful. I can do this. I want people to worship me. Thank God humans are not like that. You can laugh. It's not funny, but... Um, do you see what the origin of sin is? Arrogance? As well as blowing up of yourself to be bigger than who you really are. When God created two things. When the people... 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, whenever it was that they, when this book was written, or these verses were written, it gave humility as well as, whew, it gave like, you know, I don't have to worry. I'll explain. Humility. You're not God. Don't forget, during that time, Babylonians were no different. I am the... King, I am a God. One of the reasons why they do that is if you try to take my seat, uh, then you're going against God. And they did. And they still believe that they were gods. And a lot of it is because of fear. But I am God. Book of Revelation is going to look at that all over again. We're not doing Revelation. So from the beginning of mankind to the very end, I'm God. And this book is saying, no, you ain't. And that should actually bring resolution and actually comfort because it asks for humility. And you're not the Savior. You're not the Creator or the Savior. Which means I can't save you. I can't save myself. I need a Savior. And that actually takes a lot of pressure out of my shoulders. I have a Savior. I know that my Redeemer lives. My Redeemer wants to save me. And He can do it perfectly, not like me. If I feel like it, I'll do my best. If I don't feel like it, I won't do my best. I can't even save myself. And we already are getting hints of God saying, 
I love you. I created you. I won't leave you. I'm staying with you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. And God's life is eternity. So when God makes a promise, it's not like me. I'll do my best. God does his best. Um, so, God did not create sin, but there's a hint of the fall of the angels before the creation of the world. So, in the beginning, when there was God, and as he was creating, he created the angels, some of the angels. And according to Revelation, it's a third of the angels fell. One third. And uh, we see this in symbolic language that the, Michael and the dragon got into a battle in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, and the Satan swept with its tail a third of the stars. And one of the symbolic language of stars is angels. So he swept them, which means that he got them to be on his side. And for all eternity, they will be punished for this because they knew exactly what they were doing and they did it out of arrogance and hatred and self-love, which is not love. It's a little different than the Christmas story of angels earning wings, isn't it? It's a little different. But anyways, let's look at the rest of the verse. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. It's like saying, God is saying, I, I, I'm not leaving it this way. I'm, I'm going to play a role. So the last time you were in chaos, or today you're in chaos, or there's a situation that might happen that scares me, that's going to leave me in chaos. St. Paul is actually going to quote this. St. Paul is going to come out and say, God is not a God of chaos, he's a God of order. And somewhere it is said, let there be light. We haven't gotten into it just yet. And so St. Paul is looking at Genesis and saying, Look, people, that's why Jesus came. It's not out of the ordinary. This is God created and now saving. The next time you're in chaos, just remind yourself and say, let there be light. These are the words of God. This is Jesus saying, I'm here, I'm not leaving you. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through problems. Doesn't mean you're not going to suffer doesn't mean you're not going to have um, some decisions that you need to make that you may or may not know what to do. But I'm not leaving you. And I will always be with you. Any questions, comments, issues, discussions? Yes? Sure. I may not know the answer. Much. Correct. Angels were never human, and they, angels will never earn their wings. So they're, they're not saints in the sense that they were a human being that became, you know, saints. They're um, saints in a different way. Um, we recognize them because... Uh, the things that they have done, and God has given them a responsibility. Uh, you know, Gabriel was, was, was you know, uh, if I remember, uh, Gabriel was the one who came to Mary, and he actually takes on the responsibility of proclaiming the good news. Raphael is there also in the book of Tobit, where he's bringing in healing and strength. Michael is dealing with the devil, and this is why we pray this St. Michael prayer. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle to be our protection against the wickedness, snares of the devil, because he's the one that faced the devil. And so we look at them as our helpers. And I believe, was it yesterday or today? Yesterday, the guardian angels? So, is it today? Yesterday. Okay, so the feast of the, it's in the Latin, right? It's not ours, but we'll take it. Good. We all are given guardian angels. And so these guardian angels are there to lead us and to guide us, which is God's guarantee to say, I'm not leaving you alone. 
I'm not only going to give you myself, but I'm going to give you somebody to guide you and to help you and to lead you and to be with you. And by the way, the smallest angel, the most, that's, I'm going to use a horrible word, uh, the most insignificant, every angel is very significant, the, the, the least of the angels, let's use those words, can take on all of hell. Now, it's not because they're stronger or whatever, it's because they're always facing God and everything that they do. And so God has given us a guardian angel who wants to help me. And I, I love Pope, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Padre Pio, who says, don't let, symbolically speaking, don't let the wings of your angel get rusty. Use them. Ask them. And one of the saints, uh, I just read this quote the other day, um, probably yesterday, I just don't remember, you know, when you reach that age. Um, and they said something like, um, if you wake up in the middle of the night, just tell your angel, your guardian angel, you know, can you go and keep Jesus company at the tabernacle for me? I'm like, really? That is really cool. And why is the angel there to lead, to guide, to help, to help me worship? You know, there are some quote, possibility of some mystics who came out and actually saw visions of when we are at Mass, our angels are coming in with our petitions before the altar of God. Now, what's my petition? I want my daughter to get married. <laughs> That's it. You know, and, you know, it's, and it's, I haven't sold my home, and I keep putting St. Joseph upside down in the backyard. <laughs> it's not working. And it's unfortunate, it's like the angels are like, oh God, I'm sorry, this is embarrassing. <laughs> Bring God your deepest petition. I want to be loved, and I want to love, and I want you, and I want you fully. I want to see you. I want to be there with you. Because I know that's what's going to ultimately satisfy, not just on an earthly level. Nothing wrong, beautiful, finding the right spouse, having the right kids, finding the right career, making a difference in the world, having kids that make a difference in the world, doing the right thing, doing good, being good. Amen. Ultimately, I want to know you. You created me so that you can experience me in the body. So what's the worst thing that I can do is reject the body or misuse the body. So remember when Jesus was walking and so he says, somebody touched me. What powerful words. Somebody touched me. You're like, uh... The whole, there's a lot of fingerprints all over you, Jesus. Everybody's touching you. It's like a priest that walks down the aisle just before Mass. Everybody's going like this. <laughs> you know, and doing the sign of the cross, too. It's strange. <laughs> it is what it is. But Jesus, to say somebody touched me, it was in the physical and in the spiritual. What's the worst way that I can touch Jesus? St. Paul actually says it. And he says, <clears throat> when a man is sexually united with a woman, they become one. And then he says, and this is, I believe, chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, and he says, if a man unites himself with a prostitute, that man is bringing Christ to a prostitute. And he's now united Christ to a prostitute. God forbid. Whoa! Are you kidding me? That's the evil touch. But what's the beautiful touch? How much can we help others by the physical touch? St. James says, if your brother needs you, Help him. Don't say, good luck. And then he says, how can you say, I love you to the God that you don't see if you don't say I love you to the 
brother who's created in the image of God that you do see, which means when I help a neighbor, homeless person with a dollar, a neighbor who needs help moving, a neighbor who needs help because they're going through a hard time and just needs a pair of ears to hear, uh, whatever. What are you doing? You're allowing yourself to touch and to be touched. Whether it's the physical touch by ear, by mouth, by heart. <clears throat> and, and here's St. Jerome, by the way. St. Jerome has a phenomenal saying. During the Mass, what's the most important part of the Mass? All of it. And he actually says, we do well to make sure that the Eucharist doesn't fall. But we don't do well to have the Eucharist fall from our ears. Right. That's the word of God proclaimed. That's the readings. That's the homily. We don't do, that's the prayers of the Mass as well. It says we don't do well to let that Eucharist fall from our ears. We only worry about the Eucharist that falls from our hands or our mouths. What is he saying? We need the scriptures. We need to hear. We need to touch. We need to feel. We need to bring. And I believe it was St. Vincent de Paul. St. Vincent de Paul who had uh, a whole bunch of priests that were, and brothers and lay people that worked for the poor. And he actually says, if there is a poor person that comes in during a time of prayer, he says, leave prayer and help them. Because now your prayer isn't speaking to God, but now your prayer is you're touching God through that poor person. Whoa! Ooh, powerful words. And he says, and don't feel bad you didn't finish your prayer because you didn't have time. You finished your prayer by being there with that person. That's your prayer. Don't use that as an excuse. <clears throat> I'm adding that. You know, St. Vincent de Paul didn't, didn't say everything. So, Anyways, um, so looking at God and looking at creation and looking at how God is bringing everything, here's a, I'm going to give you a quote, and we're still stuck in verse 1. <laughs> 2, actually, we're, we got to 2. We're there. We're almost there. <laughs> uh, here's a quote from uh, the Old Testament, 1 Maccabees. This is a phenomenal story. We give this woman a name. This is a woman who witnessed all seven of her children killed for the faith. And finally, she was killed. And before that, their, their master and their teacher was. We gave her the name Shmuni, Mart Shmuni. And you might hear and see like in the different villages and different places. Here's what she says to her son. Get this. I beg you, my child, to look at the heaven and the earth and see everything that is in them that creation and recognize that God did not make them out of things that existed. Thus also mankind comes into being. Don't fear this butcher, but prove worthy of your brothers. Accept death so that in God's mercy I might get you back again with your brothers. What did she believe in? Resurrection. Unreal. How did she get there? Because she trusted the God who created See the profound ability to see the creator? If God created me, he would never let me go. So, I'll take a few more minutes. <clears throat> see if, how far we can get. I'll bet you I can finish. No, I'm not. No, I'm <laughs> so here in the story of Genesis, we see God has already created, and we have a hint of the fallen world. Um, and as I said, in a sense, God is already saving and this is, now you're looking at the chaos of water. God is going to use the chaos of water to bring life. Two ways. Much more than two ways, but I'm going to give you two ways. Oh, blood and water which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus is a font of mercy for us. I trust in you. Now water has changed. It's no longer chaotic. So when you have a whole bunch of water that's destroying your home, it's chaotic. Can you live without water? No. Get dehydrated and die. So how can then we take advantage of the chaos? How can I change chaos into a spring? 
This is the battle within. And what does God do? Baptism. It's the second one. Interestingly enough, how did the old baptism happen? Through, you go through a tub, and actually originally in the first century, you go through a river. What do they do? They put you underneath the water. What does that symbolize? It's chaos, sin, death. And guess what? You're dead. And so when we baptize your children, we're killing them on that day. From sin, from evil, so they can rise in life. I'll give you a crazy story. When my classmates were becoming priests, and they had to go through what we call practicums. Practicums are, you got to back practice weddings. I got married like two times or three times because they needed, one time they, I don't know. I got married one time and they needed a maid of honor. I was a maid of honor, believe it or not. I don't want to go there. It's not, it, it, anyways. So one of the times my classmate, and God rest his soul, he's passed away, um, needed to practice you know, he needed to actually, for his grade, for his class, he needed to, you know, to do an actual physical, full immersion baptism. And he asked me to do it. And when we practiced, there was this much water. That wasn't the problem. The act, so we practiced, and I'm like, all right, whatever. So the actual day, you do it in front of the teacher, in front of the, your whole classmates. And so... The crazy thing is he didn't give me a warning. So, Frank, I, as he's saying, I baptize you and I'm getting ready. You already pushed me under. <laughs> I didn't have time to take a breath. And he kept me there for a second. So I'm going. <laughs> he pulls me out. And I'm going, <gasps> just enough where he puts me down a second time. By the third time, I was able to get the breath, and I was getting ready to punch him in the face, but I didn't want to. <coughs> but for a split second, I experienced chaos. As kids, how many times did your older brother or whatever try to put you underwater, and, and oh, when you come up, yeah, I almost drowned, I, you know, no, I did it. That's the chaos. That's the chaos that God uses to say, you know what? I'm going to bring grace out of chaos. That's the cross. Do you know how chaotic it was when Jesus was crucified? It was evil in its worst degree, and it was chaotic in its worst degree, and God says, Father, forgive them. And God saves us. So now, look at your chaos Bring your chaos to God and say, let there be light. And God says, and God looked at light and said, it's wonderful. It is good. What is God is saying to you right now? I want you in your chaos to see light, in your darkness, in your formless and waste. I will bring order. And that's what he actually does. And if you read the rest of chapter one, day one, he's going to create day and night. Day two, he's going to create sea and sky. Day three, he's going to create land and vegetation. What is this? It's no longer formless. It now has form. Okay. Day four, sun, moon, and stars. Day five, fish and birds. Day six, man and animals on land. What do you do? It's no longer empty. Remember, the world was formless and void, empty. Now it's filled and it's wonderful. And we're going to see this later on. God created man in his image and likeness. What does the word image mean? <clears throat> I looked it up. By the way, here's a crazy thing. Actually, Pope Benedict looked it up for me. He's a great guy. He knew that I was going to look it up, and he did it for me. Um, an image is something that it is not it, but it points to something. Think about it. Right outside of here, there's an image of John Paul II. Is that John Paul II? No. What is it? It's a canvas that's pointing to the image of John Paul II. Jesus is the 
perfect image of God. So now when I see you, I see God. You're in his image. But are you in his likeness? Image is from God. Likeness is from God, but you have to participate in it. Because a mass murderer is not in the likeness of God. Image, yes. Likeness, no. Crazy. This is where we're at. But with all this, God says, let there be light. And the light shines to the darkness. And the darkness was not able to overcome it. This is John. This is not Genesis. But this is the better and the fuller understanding of Genesis. And the darkness was not able to overcome it. And that's Jesus. Any questions? Any comments? I know it's a bit chaotic. It's always chaotic on the first day of Bible study. Yes. Yes, angels. Yes. Right. That's their fall. And our sin came as a result of Adam and Eve. There is an origin to the temptation of the sin. But if Adam and Eve would have rejected the devil, there would be no sin. Do you see what I mean? It, 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 it's, a, it's a slight... They had the free will, and they actually enjoyed. It's kind of like, I'm living in my father's house. I am enjoying every single privilege in my father's house. And somebody comes to me and says... Reject your dad, and you get to keep everything for yourself. You become the father or the mother of the house. Really? So I can come out and say, I don't have a father? How'd you come into this world, lad? What do you say? You want to be God by saying to God, I don't want you. By the way, you're going to see this over and over again story of uh, the Tower of Babylon. What do they want to do? They want to knock on God's door and go, hey, we didn't need you. Look what we're able to do. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Mm. Mm. See the arrogance? See the, the problem with all of this? And so the temptation to reject the Father did come from Satan. But the free will of accepting it that created shock waves throughout all of humanity and all of creation. And this is what I was supposed to talk about today. <laughs> I don't mind staying another hour, but I don't think it's a good idea. <clears throat> That's what we'll talk about next time. It's that um, what could have God done? Everything's done. Got it. Bring it back. Recreation. But then you do that, and how many times would God have to snap his fingers? Because he gives us freedom. Because we're no longer living in a perfect state. And then we come to an issue of, well, what about sin? Okay, what about the people who were at a wedding supposed to be happy and over 120 or whatever the numbers are today died in the most horrific and evil way, where's God? And Genesis answers that, basically. But we'll get to it in the next couple of weeks. It's an important question that we can't run away from. And we can't give just basic answers. We have to look at the depth of God's grace and the problem of sin and evil. And... Um, it doesn't mean that somebody committed a sin for what happened to have all these people die in a disastrous way. But it is the, um, the effect that came from sin. All the way from the origin, Adam and Eve. And if you start to read Genesis right after that, death came into the world. When did they experience death the first time? 
Cain and Abel. Whoa. They didn't just experience death. They experienced murder. And I'm way ahead of myself. So, any other question? Yes. Yes. That's a good question. I'll ask God when I get there. <laughs> I actually doubt it because I think God knew how much he needed to create. And I don't know if it's like there's a number, even though there is a, you know, it does say there's a third. And I, I mean, probably there is a number. I just, I like God be God. You know, there is, how many, how many billions are there today? Seven something billion. Each one's got a guardian angel. That's seven billion guardian angels. And God knows them, each one by name. And that's the cool thing. Yes? Theologically wrong. Um, I don't know how far you want to go with children. I mean, if they're two years old, it's one thing. If they're 20 years old, it's another. There needs to come a time when we need to recognize and separate the angels from humans. But on the other hand, um, in an angelic way, those who came before us are also connected with us. I mean, we pray to all the saints and the saints are praying for us. And we see this in Revelation, Revelation 5, and we see the angels in Revelation 8 who are taking up the prayers of the faithful before God. So are they acting in an angelic way? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And especially if, they're, if, they were, no, if they were not faithful, that's a different question. But if they were faithful and are with God, oh, absolutely. We're still connected to them. I'm still connected to my great-grandfather that I never met. He's, he loves me. I, I love him. I don't know anything about him. But that, there, that's always going to be a connection. And... If you have children, you're connected to your great-grandchildren who will come in 150 years or whatever, I don't know. Um, and that, nothing takes away from that. And that's the cool thing. Uh, going back to the Eucharist. Yes. Am I having a No, it depends. It depends on if you have a mortal sin and... Mortal sin cannot just be based on that I committed a sin. It is also based on, because there are some habitual sins that need to be looked at in a greater way, um, you should not let anything keep you from receiving the communion unless you're having a legitimate relationship with somebody, especially married, let's say. Um, it's not your spouse, or you've killed somebody, or you've committed an abortion, or and this is where you need to do your confession. Now, the Mass itself does have ways for you to say, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive our sins and offenses. So it is confessional in a sense, in preparation to receiving communion. And so there is no reason um, just... Just to purely answer the question, no. If there is something more, then that needs to be discussed. But if just saying I didn't confess, the church is teaching is a minimum of once a year. I don't like minimums. Um, I suggest once a month. I don't mind once every two months, once every three months. I think they're go it's good to go on a regular basis, on a cyclical basis, by the way, um, which I was supposed to connect to the cycle of days and weeks and months and years that, I, God willing, I will do next week. It was a lot that I missed today. But anyway, so just... Anybody else? Yes? They're not. No, but it doesn't mean that they're not connected with you. A guardian angel is a pure spirit that was created to help you live your life and to bring you closer to God. That's what a guardian angel is. 
They're not human. They were never human. Now, can you use those words to mean something else? Sure. They're, they're there for you. They're still praying for you. They still care about you. Absolutely. But they're not, they're, you can say they're angelic. Sure. But they're not angels. Uh, humans never become angels, and angels never become human. Deceased, they're deceased humans. Yes. Well, Holy Spirit wants to help you get connected to your angel, and your angel wants to help you connect with the Holy Spirit. Speak to your holy angel. Help me. I'm confused. I need you. And, you know, if you know any stories in the scriptures, use them. You know, the angel Raphael helped Tobias go to fulfill his mission. Just like the angel Raphael who helped Tobias, I need you now. You were given to me. They're not your slaves, but your companions. <clears throat> I got to admit, I got to I, I got to spend more time with my guardian angel too. So, anywho, yes. What's the question? He's not a saint like a human being. That's a good question. I don't know why we call, I, I really don't know why we call angels saints. They're not saints like human beings who became saints. I mean, I, I, I don't know why that title was given to them. I think it's a cool title, but they're not saints like Padre Pio. Uh, in no way. I mean, all the angels are saintly, every single one, including your guardian angel. And, and that's important to keep in mind because they kept and remain faithful with God. All right. Speaking of saints, well, let's, you know, turn our gaze upon Mary, who um, helps us to understand she is the greatest of all creation, uh, second only to Jesus. So we turn to her and ask for her intercession as we also pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. We'll enjoy Jesus, and I promise next week will be a little bit more than two verses. Maybe a little bit more than a little. God bless you all.